Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to be talking about OpenAI's new model 01. We're gonna talk about what it is, what you can do with it, how it's different from all these other tools, and we're gonna break it down in a way that you can understand and then actually show you how to use it in VoiceFlow today. But before we do that, check down below to make sure that you're subscribed. It's free and you can always unsubscribe later. All right, now let's get into it. So Dennis, what, what is this new OpenAI 01 model that I keep hearing about? Yeah, so if, if you have Twitter or X or whatever it's called these days, uh, you've probably seen there's a lot of posts about it. There's a QSTAR model that was supposed to come out with reinforcement learning. There's a strawberry model. There's some cryptic memes being posted. Mm. And as far as we know that this model 01 is the nickname strawberry model. So it's a new reinforcement learning based model that uses additional compute at runtime to be better at reasoning, math, and code. OK, can you explain it to me like I'm, I'm five? <laughs> 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 so, so what that means, so we probably have a, a number of prompts that we've experimented with with ChatGPT, right? Write me an email, rephrase this writing, uh, classify the sentiment, right? Um, and OpenAI has been building these general models. But what O1 is, and O1 Mini as well, there's a mini version, of course, uh, is this model that's a chain of thought reasoning model, means that it outputs some thoughts before showing it to the user. Uh, this model is good at reasoning, math, and encoding, but not as good at, at the language stuff. So basically what's happening is in the middle, the model will say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking, and then it'll output uh, its results. And it's better at logic puzzles and some other problems that we'll show a little bit later. Okay, cool. So it sounds like um, you ask a question and it's actually executing a bunch of problems in the background to like think about this problem yep. before actually providing an exactly, answer. Exactly, exactly. Okay, cool. So where in other models, I would actually have to tell it like, hey, step one is do this, yes. step two is do that, to make it do all those and then give me an answer. So this is yes. just doing it automatically. Yes, it's doing it automatically. And one of the interesting things that OpenAI shares is that they've experimented with how long it thinks through or how many outputs oh, it okay. processes in the background. Yeah. Uh, and based on that, uh, you can see that the accuracy go goes up based on that. So okay. it's a trade-off between latency and performance for this kind of model. So why is this like important, right? Because today we can already go into GPT-4 Mini or any of these models and say, hey, like step one, step two, step three. And you know, we actually have the control that way where we can dictate how it's going to reason. So why is this so important? Yeah, let's actually take a look at the blog post and see, see what's happening here. So OpenAI introduces this as a reasoning model trained with reinforcement learning. That's kind of the the H1 here, and it proceeds to tell us about the different types of problems it's good at solving. So it talks about coding, competitive coding questions here at the top, so good at coding, uh, which is important if you're building a coding agent or even if you're learning to code. Oh, okay, cool. Right? Like you, you were learning JavaScript for I was, a while. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now you're pretty proficient build it, building thanks, all those thanks. functions. Thanks, yeah, me and, me and my friend GPT. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you're friend 01. Um, so, so it's good at, at helping you code. Uh, there's a number of different like complex uh, knowledge and reasoning-based questions. So you can see here there's like math Olympiad, PhD uh, style questions here as well. And one of the things I was mentioning earlier is the performance on accuracy when you add more compute time uh, at test. So the big breakthrough here is previously when you want to train a model, you want to make it bigger and train it on more and more tokens. That's sort of how we got the advancement of like GPT-4, 3.5, Llama 3, uh, the 405 billion parameter model, is you increased uh, the training time compute. But now here is that what happens if you only increase the test time compute? So letting the model iterate when you're sending it a request, okay. and basically having it come up with results, refine them, and provide an answer. OK, um, explain that part again. So it sounds like uh, typically models are trained on just like a volume of data, right? Yes. So I'm giving you way more data, you have more information, you're now going to get better. Yes. And so that was the difference between 3, 3.5, and 4, which exactly. is the amount of data. And so now you're saying that rather than doing more data, uh, we're actually having it like train itself almost, so spend more time learning with the data? Or? So, so you can imagine the model is, is deployed on OpenAI servers or Azure servers, wherever it is. Um, and rather than making sure that model was trained on more and more data, you just have the model run through more iterations when you send it a request. So when you say, how many R's are in strawberry, okay. you have that thinking time, right, that OpenAI talks about of processing the information okay. for longer. And using this technique, again, OpenAI hasn't shared too many details, but it provides better results. OK. So it sounds like rather than being trained on more information and seeing more examples, it's now like, I've got enough information. Now let's just run more cycles on the existing information exactly. and then probably evaluate that. Yep. Yeah. OK. Got it. So I mean, that, that's helpful to understand how it was created. But can you show me like what are actual examples that this is better for? Like when would yeah. I choose to use this versus Foro Mini or something else? 
OK, so let's go in, into the ChatGPT interface. And let's ask the, the infamous question, uh, how many R's are in strawberry? So this is a common like puzzle that, that you'd get. And now you can see here it says thinking. Why is this hard? So th this is traditionally hard just based on sort of self-reference and reasoning of models. Uh, so if you remember, if you've used the API before, you're charged on tokens. Yeah. And tokens are collections of characters for models. And these tokens can make it difficult to actually reason of what an R is, because there might be actually many tokens that represent R. Oh, OK. Yeah. So, so that makes it more complex. There's not just an R token. There's many sort of, if you study linguistic, in linguistics, there's like root words and, and other things huh. like that. OK, cool. So yeah, so it makes it more complex. Um, <laughs> Given how infamous this example is, they might have included in the training data, uh, but who knows. Um, but these are the types of problems, these reasoning problems, that it does better at. Okay. And you can see here it says, thought for a few seconds, and it gives you a little bit of, of an explanation what's happening here. So it's counting the number of Rs, it's tallying them, okay. and providing I mean, them. This seems like kind of like a basic example. Can you do something that's a bit more complex, like maybe have it like build an app or, or something like that? Yeah, so, so we can try a coding example. Let's say, uh, can you code me a... Oh, Let's do like, like 3D snake. I saw, I saw someone do that on Twitter this morning. I thought that was pretty cool. A snake game. OK, in Python. So let's see what happens here. Uh, we haven't <laughs> tried this example out, so it might be thinking for a little while. But we'll do a logic puzzle at the end as well. OK, cool. So you can see here, what's, what's interesting is it's providing you oh, the different cool. steps, right? Yeah. Crafting the code, evaluating it, and I think we can actually open this up. Oh, so you can see this in real time? Yeah, as yeah, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. As it's pulling it out? Yeah. So rather than outputting all the tokens that you'd see in like chain of thought reasoning, uh, it has a different steps here. OK, so we have the initial steps. Let's go through the actual This is cool, because like this, this whole top part here, this is what I would probably put in when I'm trying to prompt it, right? It's yeah. like, you are a software developer. The first thing you're going to do is this. You're going to craft the code. You're going to evaluate yeah. game engines to create the code. But it's doing it way better than I would. Yeah. Um, so OK, so it's doing that in the background, and then it follows its own steps. Yes. yes. So it's like multiple prompts in one that it's doing all on its own. Yeah, so, so the, the speculation on how the model is trained is basically consolidating that sort of multi-prompt approach and explanation approach into something a little bit more dynamic. So let's actually see what it said. So it tells us to install this uh, Arsena library, mm -hmm. so pip install. Uh, then it tells us the code that we need here. So we have this app. We have some instructions on configuring the game, building the snake model, keep scrolling down. Uh, and then it gives us some instructions on on how to play and how to add additional features here. So okay, pretty interesting. Oh, cool. Okay, so that seems pretty decent. Um, and so like, you know, there's a bunch of other tools that have come out recently, right? There's um, like Claude has a bunch of stuff that's on top of their model, like in their console. Um, you've got Cursor. Uh, you've got like Replit Agent that really help you actually build apps themselves. They're kind of like better copilots. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like, how are these similar? How are these the same? Uh, are you able to use these tools with uh, a one, or would you be able to in the future? Yeah, so you can. Uh, so one of the interesting things on the announcement is a number of different tool providers announced that they support O1 or have been using it. Hmm. Uh, if you remember the Devon agent, they actually shared additional benchmarks oh, yeah. uh, and how they, they performed better. So earlier on, they shared that they had a 26% accuracy uh, on a benchmark or somewhere around there. And now I think they should. They're at 73% using the new O1 model. Hmm. So you're having this whole ecosystem being built, right? With, with Cursor, um, with Replit, I think they have their own internal model. Yeah. You might be able to use O1 as well if they have that integration. And it's combining it all together to build this new ecosystem of coding and developing. Got it. Apps. Very cool. So there's, there's a subset of, of problems, specifically like development and coding, that are actually really geared towards a one being good at with this yes. reasoning. And so a lot of tools that are, are kind of built on top of that yes. can now use this almost like a specialized model, a specialized for these tasks. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And if, if we head back just through some of the benchmarks here, that's something that OpenAI has shared. It's like you can see some of the math coding ones. And it also shows some of the, the trade-offs here, right? So you can see the comparison here of GPT-4.0 and OpenAI O1 Preview. So mm -hmm. they've released Preview and Mini. The, the full O1 model isn't actually out yet. But you can see some of the examples here. Um, and you can see one for coding, right? Coding examples, how the different models perform, right? The O1 family is much better than GPT-4.0. Okay. All right, so, so here you can see, actually, this is on the mini blog post, the O1 mini. Okay. You see a comparison to GPT-4.0, O1 mini, and O1 preview. Mm. You can see the time it takes to execute. Uh, GPT-4.0 takes three seconds. It's pretty fast. 
uh, O1 Mini uh, takes nine seconds, and O1 Preview, you can see it's still still counting here. It oh, wow. takes okay. 20 plus seconds, right? So really depends on what the task is, what the, what the model uh, need, needs to do. Um, so it's not perfect for every use case, right? So if you need something that's really fast, for example, voice applications uh, or even simpler prompts, please don't use O1. It's, yeah, it's, it'll be brutal. Yeah, it'll be very, very challenging. Okay. Um, so I think that's really important to understand is every model has its place yeah. uh, in the cycle. Uh, one more, I actually want to show you a logic puzzle where O1, we, let's refresh this. So one of the challenges with large language models is they typically memorize solutions, mm -hmm. right? So do you remember the, the puzzle we learned as a kid? There's like uh, a person who's like a farmer, they have a hen, they have some wheat. Dude, you, no, what are you, you talking you, about? <laughs> you don't know this puzzle? <laughs> Maybe in Eastern Europe, you know, where <laughs> Dennis is homeland. <laughs> No, this is definitely... Yeah, I've never seen this in my life, man. I don't okay. know what you're talking about. So, so, so basically, basically, the logic puzzle is that there, there's a farmer, okay. uh, there's a hen, there's a fox, and there's some, some uh, seeds. Okay. And to transport, uh, you have to transport all three across the river, but you can only take one with you. Right? Now, the problem here is that the, the fox might eat the hen, and the hen might eat the seeds. Okay. Yeah, so it's basically a logic puzzle to do this. Yeah, I've never heard this. You've never heard this? Really? Really? Yeah, okay. yeah, not at all. <laughs> Maybe somebody in the audience has heard of it before validate me a little bit. Um, but basically, I was trying out this puzzle with, with uh, O1, and if you give it some variations, it does it correctly, but it still typically tries to memorize the answer. Okay, because there's it. so many copies of this puzzle on the internet that it makes assumptions. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it makes assumptions on um, the different criteria. So. Let's change the criteria. Let's say um, I'm a farmer, which I definitely am. <laughs> I want to bring a chicken and a fox across a river with me. Uh, I can only bring one at a time. If I choose the order. So originally there's three. I have simplified it to two. So you can see here, O one's going to, to think. Uh, and provide us with an answer. You can see it's assessing options, going, going through that whole cycle. Mapping the journey, that's, that's pretty deep. Navigating the journey, taking a closer look. Right. These are really funny. Nice. Okay, so here we go. So we have the, the different actions here. Um, take the chicken across, return alone. Uh, take the fox across, bring the chicken back. So you can see here, it's trying to... Oh, okay. So to, it's like actually running through all of these different scenarios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in its head to be like, okay, here's yeah. what you should do. So, so see, we, we have, an, have an answer. Okay. Um, and it actually didn't get the right answer here. It's... it's womp womp. Womp womp, right? It, it, it happens, right? Um, it's trying to navigate based on its training data and reason through it. So it's not a perfect model yet. Okay. Um, but... Just keep in mind, these models are getting better. There are these benchmarks. Try it out yourself. Okay. Uh, it's really important to have your own prompt and your test to, to solve. Okay. Um, but it's not perfect. It's not AGI. It's not the end of the world, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it's a cool model, but it's really important to understand what works and what doesn't. Okay, cool. Um, cool, sweet. So uh, like, how, how can I use this in voice flow? Um, and, and honestly, also, when would I use this, given the latency? I yeah. um, would love to understand like what are some use cases that you can think of, because Something that's coming to mind for me is like, you know, I would still use my typical models, like yep. whether that's Claude or GPT or Gemini in responses. Yep. Um, but something like this might be really interesting for when I'm like triggering a set of actions, right? I don't really yep. have a response. Maybe I've got like a set step that's processing this and then actually just sends it over to an API that sends an email later on. Yep. So I don't have to deal with latency. So can you walk me through how I would use it in VoiceFlow today until we actually add it natively? Absolutely. Uh, so right now, uh, you might have seen this before in our GPT 4.0 video, um, but you can make a function and call uh, the O1 model. So, cool. you, so you can see here, we're in a voice of function. This is up on the website uh, right now that you can access. And we're just calling O1 preview. You can also call O1 mini. Mm -hmm. uh, the one big difference here is that you cannot include a system prompt. You will get an error if you include a system oh, prompt. Oh, really? Yeah, you'll get okay. an error. So you can only include a user prompt here. There's no system prompt. Mm. So let's go to our workflow to see what it looks like. So it's pretty simple here. I'm just going to capture the user response, respond with uh, oh, one. Oh, you're just making a little loop here. Yeah, make a little it. loop, yeah, kind of yeah. like ChatGPT. Let's go ahead and hit run. It's waiting for me to say, so I can say how many R's are in strawberry. Okay, cool. Very, very simple example that we showed earlier. You can see it's taking a little while here, but eventually we should, we should get a response. This is the latency. 
Um, oh, cool. Oh, so it actually gives a full yeah. response back. OK, nice. Yeah, so you can see here, um, the model temperature is set higher at 1 so oh, by, so by, by default. So, so it gives response. you some, some, some variety here. But yeah. You get the response here. I think another great use case is uh, figuring out what the next action is yeah. uh, for models, but also doing things like hallucination checks. Mm. Right? You have some logical principles. Right? Make sure to respond based on this information. Check this out, yeah. and then respond. Um, but if it's time sensitive, it's not the best use case. Yeah, especially with latency, I think it's going to be really important to figure out like what role this actually plays in your design. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think on a, on a really basic level, kind of like we have here, you can use voice flow to just talk back and forth with an AI model. More advanced uh, examples really use voice flow in combination with like a number of other like AI services and tools. So you're not just using AI to generate responses, but you're actually using it to like process information, use AI to determine logic, yeah. um, understand, you know, is this a valid email, not a valid mm -hmm. email, and, and, and many more that we have tons of examples on. But I feel like with this one, just given the latency on it, like maybe this is actually best for just straight actions, yeah. right? Like. Uh, one of the things you can do in voice flow is you can trigger off, uh, you can trigger a workflow to start, and so you can almost treat this like a more uh, advanced kind of like Zapier, right? Where you've got like a whole bunch of things that are happening. You've got O1 oh, that's generating something mm -hmm. that receives a response back that passes it over to another model, sends it somewhere else, and then maybe sends an email off. Uh, but there's no actual responses back to the user, so they're never waiting on a response. Yeah, and I think if you're building some kind of a system, maybe you're making a little copilot yeah. uh, for code coding or, or something else or mm. providing like a tutor tutoring yeah. app, right? So you can see on, on the, the benchmarks here, right, on coding, um, the, the models do better, uh, STEM questions as well, right? So yeah. this is, I think, where it can really excel in providing these answers. Again, it depends on the use case. You can build yeah. anything you want in voice, though, right? Copilot, um, different types of knowledge bases, mm. uh, internal applications. So. Yeah, uh, play around with these different models, figure out where the best place is to use them. That's yeah. usually the, the best way to build, right? Yeah, I, I think that this is probably comes into, well, for anyone who's out there using voice flow with like a custom interface to be able to build like an actual co-pilot in your app, um, that's probably where this starts becoming really valuable, right? Because you can basically build like a coding co-pilot or even our own like in-app assistant Tico that actually helps people with code now too, yep. um, being able to leverage something like this and actually output code in like a code block um, or, or something else. So. Yeah, I think this is super cool. But uh, thanks for breaking this down, Dennis. This is really helpful to understand like well, <laughs> what this actually is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ha happy to do so. There's been so much energy going into the release of this model. So yeah. th thanks for joining me and for breaking this down.